Welcome to Virtual AWP Writer to Writer Conversations. I'm Kathy Reidenhauer, Director of Membership at AWP and Co-Director of the Writer to Writer Program. I'm excited to introduce this new series of conversations and readings with former mentors and mentees of the Writer to Writer Mentorship Program. Now in its 14th season, this free biannual program matches emerging writers and published authors for a three month series of modules on topics such as craft, revision, publishing, and the writing life. In Writer to Writer Conversations, we will explore mentorship as an experience and a practice, the, celebrate the generous contributions of our volunteer mentors, and hear firsthand from our participants about their time in the program. We're opening this series with a reading by the mentees of Jim Cates who has shepherded four mentees to this program since joining it as a mentor in season seven. Jim Cates is a poet, literary translator, and co-director of Zephyr Press. He has been awarded three National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships, an individual, individual artist fellowship from the New Hampshire State Council on the Arts, and the Cliff Becker Book Prize in Translation. He has published three chapbooks of his own poems and one full book, The Briar Patch. He has translated a dozen books by Russian and French poets, has edited two anthologies of translations, and collaborated on four books of Latin American poetry and translation. Now, let's turn things over to Jim. I am proud of an occasion to present the work of four poets I've had the privilege of working with during the past four years. Each of them has contributed to my own growth as a reader and a writer, and we welcome this chance to introduce them to one another and to showcase their work. We thank Kathy Rittenauer and Miranda Gonzalez of the Associated Writing Programs for providing the platform both for the original working introduction and for this reading. Michigan poet Lynn Patterson's work has appeared in Ruminate, the Notre Dame Review, Smartish Place, Moon City Review. She is the author of the book Light That Sounds Like Breaking, and three chapbooks, Tesla's Daughter, Walking Back the Cat, and her most recent, which he will show you in a minute, Matroshka Houses from Kelsey Press in July, this last July. She has a tremendous range in her writing from sonnet to prose poem and relishes exploration and endured my critiques. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Uh, this is the new manuscript. I'll be reading four poems from it today. Jim helped me reorder and improve this manuscript, and I'm very grateful. Elusive. <clears throat> Kaleidoscope roof lines. Sloped, hipped, gabled. Sunroom overlaid with driveway, porch, as if someone's playing with double exposures, jamming slides into the projector all at once. The story of home can't be unearthed by orderly excavation, studied one stratum at a time. Even if you run string and quadrants, label religiously. Jumble of wax pilgrims and jewelry boxes with dancers on the lids framed diplomas and watering cans, sump pumps and inner tubes. Here, a bedroom lit with Northern light, another washed warm from the South. Part of the story is what the kids carried off to apartments, what sold before the move to Florida. Time parses old input through translucent scrims, and memory does a kind of collapsing, filing system as collage, as Drummond Island pudding stone, spotty cluster of red jasper, chert, and quartz. Keep an open mind. If you insist on orderly narrative, one slide after the other, you won't get the whole effect. This poem speaks to my state of mind after my mother's death. The thing behind and the thing behind that. I can't see why grief brought me here to this kitchen too small for baking, to rolling pin and breadboard. 
These are illogical days. No thing seems to follow reasonably another. I've given up on cause and effect. Guilt's like that. The more you dig for the root, the more suckers you find branching sideways, curling into the mud. Today I'm baking bread, stirring, kneading, punching down. It's been 30 years. Warm like earth in spring, this elastic dough I turn and braid and mark, brought alive by a sprinkle of yeast on warm water. Rocking rhythm between the heels of my hands and the give of gluten. Wind howls a word I've never heard, repeating. I know better than to think I can translate. And here is a yoga poem for the Midwest. Rust belt asanya, stand tall, feet rooted in the soil of the pioneers, legs straight, body aligned, head floating like a corn tassel above stalks, with shoulders back and eyes forward, pull your pockets inside out. Avoid gazing out windows with views of abandoned factories, vacant houses. Bend over, hands on floor, lower self to knees, hold, rise if you can. And this is the last one I'll read from the collection. It's the title, Selection, Matryoshka Houses. <clears throat> Cunning construct of time and light. Close this one into that. See how they fit inside each other. Fit me, one me or another. The cedar home in the woods, halves open, revealing a green, high-peaked house. Place of telescoping hours. What was it? that lived there with us, ghosting shadows in the corner of my eye. Inside the low gray bungalow, rooms flooded pink with sun through the crab apple. Deepest in, most tightly held, red brick, rounded door, house of attics and cubbies, platter-sized records played on the Victrola, a pipe stand. Music rises from them all, big band, folk, rock and roll, all of it a wild looping cannon, pitch and speed staggered, crabbing memories, remixing. Fragments of melody pushing and stacking the years. Brass doorknobs, root cellar damp, sisters wrapping apples to store in barrels, singing Panis Angelicus off key. A basement laundry where we huddled as midnight sirens wailed, where the dog whimpered and peed every 4th of July. My mother's song hums below each roof, flows between walls, stitching the years. Snow drifts at one door while leaves fall around the next. Heat, lightning, voices echo as if down long halls. When the fog moves in, I take them all apart. I wrote this poem while thinking about the language of trees. Almost telepathy. In tree, drink rhymes with osmosis sunlight with oxygen. The usual rhythm of things in tree is more often trochaic tetrameter than iambic pentameter, the pumping system being entirely different from the human heart. There are many terms for up and down, 17 degrees of wet or dry. The most common message is more, sugar, light, water, nitrogen, 
When signals from a tree fade and falter, the others reach out. That, in tree, sounds like love. Here is a poem for all who have uh, found themselves in places of uncertainty or disorientation during this challenging time. Don't struggle to keep your balance. A wobble won't hurt. Welcome to the world of almost and not quite. A near mirrored world with just a breath of imbalance. If you require horizon, distinct seam between one element and the next, you're ruined. Float in the middle state, halfway between Rorschach and X-ray. Maybe you can't recall what you loved that you had to let go before you could be born into this life. But those other moments, suspended between a breakup and writing your world, or hearing the lock of one door click before you see if the next will open, you know the ozone smell edging a boundary, the subtle current frizzling a new threshold, an unfamiliar passage, the place of pump and flow, flux. Mastering your first bicycle, crossing the swaying bridge, you are most alive. Hear your heart pound. This will be my last poem. It ends on a fairly hopeful note. Before then, I want to thank Jim and my fellow readers and the folks at AWP, and especially those who are visiting to listen. Swamped almost. And now on the River Loire, a mechanical elephant almost 40 feet high, lumbers through town with a deck full of spectators on his back, feet moving slow as a mammoth's wading into a tar seep. My own step grows mechanical in a bog of nip, nip, hip knee pain and dread for my frail father, helpless sister and failing friend. Every last sad letter of the universe adds its burden, slows me until I'm moving through clay. But crows learn to talk to squirrels and rooftop bees survive a cathedral fire. Someone managed to photograph the mouth of a black hole and I have not yet seen a sorrowless tree or tasted a plum cot, heard snow chime as it falls. Days when I stumble into a grand word rhythm or feel the muscle joy of a long hike. When I see with new eyes the implausible wonder of the planet breathing, the red glow of the hunter's moon, the march of a thousand leaf color cutters through the ravine. Clay falls away. Nothing slows my step. Thanks. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. That's a good start. Um, and now we'll hear from Joyce Schmidt, who was born in New York City. She reserved, received her BA from Harvard and went on to study Russian literature at Columbia, where she twice won Pushkin Prize for Poetry Translation. She and her husband lived in Palo Alto, and she works as a psychotherapist. More than 100 of her poems have been published in Literary Imagination, New Ohio Review, Antioch Review, Missouri Re Review, Poetry Daily, among others. Her work has been twice shortlisted for the Bridgeport Prize, long listed for the National Poetry Society Award and the Plough Prize, nominated for a Pushcart Prize, commended for a Hippocrates Prize, mm -hmm. and given honorary mention for Tor House Poetry Prize. And I can attest that she is also a very generous hostess. Joyce? Thank you, Jim, and thank you for being here. I was born in 1942 when my father was in the army. My mother would visit him on the base, leaving me with my grandparents. I remember being in bed alone at my grandparents' house, 
feeling strange, and trying to sleep. The name of this poem is Trying to Sleep from the Missouri Review. As I was watching strips of light that moved across the ceiling in the night, as I was lying in my baby body in that giant bed, uneasy feelings keeping me awake, men were killing people in another place, ordinary men, my father learning war. I didn't hear the crystal break or smell the human smoke or see the bodies hanging from the lampposts in the towns or feel the swarming armies smash or hear the airplanes scream and bomb. All I saw were eerie strips of light that moved across the ceiling in the much too quiet night. This poem is from the Antioch Review. It's called Abandonment. My mother leans down in her beam of light and says, my dear, my dear, you needn't love me anymore. When I was born, there was a war. My mother went away so long that when she came again and reached to me, I cried. I didn't know her face. Her body was a different place. I pulled away. She didn't understand, drew back her hand and saved it for another child until I was a woman grown. And then she needed me, but I had been on ice so long that I was cold. Now she's gone and I am eight months old in baby grief that cannot speak. Here's a story my father used to tell from his time in the army. You'll hear me mention the Battle of the Bulge, a bloody battle in Europe where 75,000 American soldiers were killed. It's called How My Father Got to Watch Me Grow Up from the Broad River Review. He was a musician, 24, in glasses, uniform and gun, as though he were a soldier, bugling revelry, saluting, marching, brave. He was a five foot six MP who tossed his rifle to the German prisoners, then vaulted up and sat beside them in the transport truck. He was a depot guard who flinched the time he had to crack his billy club. Who after playing taps, would play his violin or trumpet for the officers at mess and feel his fear dissolve in cadences and rhythms and the clinks of plates. The peaceful sight of men and women dancing, oh, he played, remembering long afternoons of scales and sharps and flats when he was young and didn't know someday an officer who heard him play would summon him into his office and would ask, you think you're ready to go overseas? And when my father paled, would laugh and find my father's papers in among the stack intended for the Battle of the Bulge, would separate them out and wink. Now fast forward with me to almost the present day. My husband is having surgery for heart flutter. He's already been through a triple bypass and a stent insertion. It's called Heart's Cure from the Tor House newsletter. One, flutter is a dainty word. It's kind of sweet and brings to mind a hummingbird, a monarch butterfly, a baby quickening, the runaway excitement of a new love. I try to hypnotize myself with flutter, 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 not to think about a tiny spot inside the isthmus of your heart that makes it flutter, not to think about a catheter snaked into you 
to burn your heart and brand it mortal. Part two. There's nothing beautiful about this weight. The only beauty was your face, blue eyes, blue gown, before the nurses wheeled you in. Oh God, please guide the catheter that brings the fire. Is this the very moment when you burn? Almighty everlasting God, may this oblation be pleasing and acceptable to thee. Part three. God rolled the stone away three times. The first time was the hardest. You were torn and bruised and tired. Wires wound and bound around your healing bone. The second time, a tiny metal meshwork tube undammed your blood. The third time, only yesterday, a catheter engraved its mark, a burn ablation deep inside your heart, and you walked forth again, translucent, bright, backlit in miracle. This poem is called Umbrella Spokes, and it's from Cape Rock. Poetry makes nothing happen, W.H. Auden. Life is a science. Nothing goes to waste. When the spokes of an umbrella in the rain remind you of the rib cage of a hungry child and make you cry as you drive by, don't be surprised. That's how the world is made. Things speak for other things. Nothing is itself. And poetry makes nothing bloom like cactuses and turns the rain to manna on the wet cement. But that's for later. Teardrops take a while to penetrate. Today is not the day. Today you're running, running, running late. Now that I'm old, I find that, like many of us, I have a different perspective on my mother. This poem is addressed to her. Tree Mother, from the Linden Avenue Literary Journal. A woman can be proud and stiff when on love intent, W.B. Yeats. I refuse to love you then when you were old, although I felt your heartwood drying in the drought. I flew 3,000 miles to water you but all the saline in the hospital could not re-wet your phloem and your xylem never flowed again. The beetles burrowed into you. Your cracking leaves turned brown and fell and then the fires came for you. Now lakes and rivers gather murk from rain no longer filtered by your roots. The air is empty of the oxygen you made. Dry grass and brush Profane the footprint that you left behind. And I am old and burning for your shade. I who did the daughter, the da I who did the duty that a daughter does. So proud, so stiff, so cold. This is called Lani Akia from the Missouri Review. Streams of galaxies flowing through space reveal the contours of a structure known as Laniakea from the Scientific American. An astronaut must find his death familiar, somewhere he's been before, a place outside of place, outside of time, where stars rush by and galaxies form into filaments and sheets and voids the microstructure of some greater whole, the vast nerve reti of a fractal god. But death will take me by surprise. The way my mother, drugged to sleep, suddenly unclosed her eyes and stared, amazed, before she died. This poem, uh, Twin Peaks, is the name of a hilltop in San Francisco 
with a panoramic view of the city. My husband and I are standing there, watching the sun go down. Sunset from the top of Twin Peaks, from Flying South Magazine, San Francisco. Because there is no other thing to do, I give permission for the day to pass, this day with you when we are young. As we have been for such a long, long time, our hair has turned to precious metal and some Dutch master has illuminated us with fine drawn pencil lines. Because there is no other way, I give permission for the lava stream of headlights along Market Street to flow, for buildings going pink with alpenglow to shine, for pearls festooned along the bridge to Berkeley to light up across the bay, anticipating dusk. Because there is no other thing to do, I turn toward the west and give permission for the sun to fall towards its gold reflection in the ocean as I stand with you and watch it sink and cool to red and disappear. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Wow, that's uh, um, okay. And now we move to Lucas Jacob whose poems and prose have appeared in literary journals, including Southwest Review, Cherry Tree, and Rhino, and in trade journals, ranging from Education Week to computer graphics and applications. He's the author of the full-length poetry collection, The Seed Vault, which I had hoped to show you, and the chapbooks, A Hole in the Light, and Wishes Wish Just Hard Enough. He's hoping for a 2022 or 2023 release of a second full length collection and for an opportunity once again to read, to converse and sign books in person. Luke was the first of the poets here this evening, this afternoon, whenever it is, I had the luck to work with and the luck to continue working with. Luke. Thanks, Jim. Rue from the French, and so R-O-U-X. Not an old English name for misgiving, though it would be nice to be able to rue the day, smoothing it out as it darkens. Slow. To my ear, it always sounded like not fast gin as if by virtue of a somehow casual fermentation, the stuff would creep up on you, thickening your thoughts and tongue before you knew what hit you. How delicious to know now that the sour fruit of Prunus spinosa is called a droop and does exactly that in blackthorn bunches, hanging in tight knit clumps like organs drawn in against needing a quick one for the road. Those two poems are from a homophone series with which uh, that I worked on with Jim uh, probably about two years ago now. And they've come out in a chapbook. They're a part of the full length collection that I hope will come out in a year or two. The next little set of poems I'm going to read is from the Seed Vault, the book Jim mentioned, which was published at the end of 2019. The first three, are from a section of the book whose titles are all from political parlance of the years 2015 to 2020-ish. So titles like Carnage, Ban, Security, I think you'll get the idea. The first of three that I'll read is called Winner. That oily puddle you're standing in, that's the rainbow you desired in a package you can afford. The cracked ground between us is yours so long as you don't cross it. The wind that blew the papers from your hand and over the gleaming razor wire, that's my word of honor, my bond. Why, the sun itself that raises up both steam and glare from the wet concrete, that sun I give in consideration of everything you've done for me and everything you've yet to do. Make sure you look at it sideways with respect for its light and in awe 
of all the darkness it obscures. Industry. On Sidium Volcano Midnight, or Volcano Queen, flouts a dozen five-piece blossoms in lemon, rust, and cinnamon on every budding stalk. Its care requires the genius only of constancy. Moderate the medium, measure the morning sun through a gauze of sheer curtain trimmed to filter the light, and collect rainwater to avoid the softening salts that tune the city's water to our skin. Be honest about what you can and cannot control, though this requires that you learn to lean in and whisper, nothing, nothing, nothing. Do not promise the work. Work the promise of every tiny shoot that speaks of leaf or flower, knowing that none is guaranteed to return the fiery burst that brought you to your first devotion, but that one might one day do so. So long as you remain humble, unseduced by your own glowing vision, holding up instead the mundane dignity that bends to the call of a workaday song. This poem was written almost exactly four years ago, probably this week, last week, at least in its initial draft. And it's the last of these political parlance poems that I'll read before moving to something rather different. It's called Threat. Everyone agrees. We are enduring a bitter season, cold shouldering past one another as if our tracks, once laid at our heels, will abide and show themselves straight should we lose our way in the dark of day. Danger lies only in hesitation. To be sure is to be true. A canny proposition, this consensus that everyone is equally aggrieved by every storm. It implicates even the crocuses, just here, in the mud and mulch bed in the lee of the house. Their truth, too, must be relative, no more valid than some unflowering at work in another small yard, some not poking through in an annual act of defiance, an anti coloring of dark, wet earth with pastel wisps of dawn. The non bulbs that disannounce the coming of spring were not plopped with dirt and a little hope by gardeners never down on their knees in holes just big enough to cradle the hearts of all those things that would reach for the light. I'm gonna do a little bit of formalism, still from the seed vault, but scattered throughout the text. The next three poems are sonnets. The first and third use fairly traditional sonnet rhyme schemes. The middle one uses consonants in place of rhyme. The first is called The Next Day. The will constricts. To do becomes have done. Of all the amber stains, the dappled light of morning spreads across the body. None reveals the wound that matters. None has quite the look or feel of scattered shot. How holes converge and bleed as one. How presence drains the past of love. How memory extols the pain as virtue undersold. A grain of poison pressed beneath the tongue until its burn subsides. It's not enough to splinter the sun. The jagged shards hung like teeth from a string at the throat to toughen up, to shut it down. There's still the matter of what remains, the chalk outline, the splatter. The poem is called Hungarian Sonnet One because it's one of a small series of sonnets that incorporate the Hungarian language and that have to do with the city of Budapest, Hungary. You think that paradichom is the fruit and fall in love again with naming. Here you cry, are people after my own heart who hang Eden and apple in one word, fat on the tongue. But then you learn your paradise is grown on a vine and not on a branch. On your tomato, Saws four inch per bunch. You comfort yourself. 
The early rabbis saw in biblical fruit puns for desire, citron, and destruction, carob. You note what scholars now favor, pomegranate, granatalma. It sounds to your ear like a soul stone, ineffable, but hewn down somehow still and held tight in the hand. This sonnet is one of three that make up uh, a piece called the San Antonio Triptych. Each one deals with a portion of the history of the city of San Antonio, Texas. The first one is the one I'm going to read. It's called The Devil's Ballroom. Don Albert's ghost leads a ghoulish swing band through its paces even today. He died in San Antonio in 1980. But hide your eyes from the ruins of the Shadowland and tune your ears to the baked clay jazz of the territory band whose brass charts so gladdened the feet and lightened the heart. And you'll hear the tunes drifting through the gauze of the years. Albert Blue with Troy Floyd's boys from 26 to 29, then led a band whose every brazen horn swell said, we bring you sin and all its host of joys. The ballroom grew so hot with Albert's sound that the whole damn place burned straight to the ground. This next poem will be the last one I read. I want to thank Jim, not just for hosting this, but for all the work we've done together now in three and a half years. We still talk about poems every couple weeks, his, mine, and all the ones we've read in the world. And I want to thank, thank Joyce, Lynn, and Susan for their work and for joining in this event. And of course, to thank AWP and anyone and everyone who's listening. This last poem, when I wrote it, uh, echoed place names. Um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Columbine. Then over the course of the last maybe year and a half or two years, it started to be associated with people's names. Arbery, Taylor, Floyd. Over the course of the past year, it's come to echo a scale of loss that, I mean, I, I don't know how to count in the millions. So it seems to change what the title means with some regularity. It's um, a villanelle called Toll. There's nothing much to say. We try instead to remember how to feel. Sometimes I think we never should have learned to count. The dead have better ways. They lean in, head to head in blue light, teetering always on the brink, and unable quite to touch, learning instead to share the silence. Peace. We living wed our darkest fears to our desires, a link we never should have made. To count the dead is to risk the loss of the lives they led to mathematics to forget distinct features. Worse, to say this many instead of no more is cowardice. We have said enough by now of how and why. We shrink, we lie. Perhaps it's time to count the dead promises we've piled on our pyre of dread, to face what we have done and not to blink. With nothing much to say, we sigh instead. We never should have learned to count the dead. Thank you. And thank you, Luke. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I hear somebody, somebody with papers. Most recently, I've been working with Susan Tatner, who lives and writes in central New Jersey. Her poetry has appeared in Artemis, The Voices Project, the Front Porch Review, and other publications. She's the author of one chapbook, Trader's Bluff, for which I could not find a photograph online, and is currently completing a second. Susan teaches creative writing online at the Writer's Studio. Together, she and I explore the possibilities and limitations of formal prosody 
dancing in and out of verse. And right now I'd like her to dance into it. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. It's been a great treat listening to uh, my colleagues. Enjoyed everybody's work. Uh, the first poem I'm going to read is called Tiki. Flying always starts with falling in love with air, turns into bouncing on currents, banking left around the wardrobe, pushing into orbit around the shining planet of light in the center of the ceiling. It ends with a flutter of muscular perfection to lower myself onto the proprietor's index finger when she whistles for me. I tap, tap on her nail to call for treats, the golden millet spray, the Fuji apple slice, the dot of a thistle seed I smuggle inside my beak for my beloved, trapped inside the plastic window in our cage, who always bears the self-same treat for me. I strike the bell before I rise up the ladder to let my tiki know it's time to bob and preen. My second poem is another love poem called Time, Space. I am not old. I am as young as you remember me that day, that hour of gold behind my head and out again. And here you are, my boyish husband. The sun kisses your perfect mouth, your shining teeth. The light is aging fast when it reaches our eyes past and present at once like us. Full of grudges and hopes, we roll inside the green and blue spaceship of our lives. Time's a trick of the light, space a song resung. They keep us together forever young. My next poem is called The Death of Pat Nixon. Not in the last breath, rattled in scarred and burning lungs. Pat propped up on pillows so she can see the window framed tree line over his enormous jowled face, looming at the bottom of the duvet, straddling the divide between Pat is here and Pat is not. But over the years, slowly, drifting away, standing two steps behind him, finding the last row in the group picture and poking her fur-hatted head up high at the last minute, holding her breath when others say cheese, but making a suitably cheerful face, lips edged with the faintest smile, eyes tight as the hairdo she has crafted for her each week in a private session with a noisy girl who deserves a tip but the handlers give her no money of her own, just enough cigarettes to last the week, in spite of his disgust with her weakness, because he knows without her smoke breaks, she could not survive the life he needs her to share. And with each drag, she pulls into her lungs more than nicotine, arsenic, and tar, more than acetone and butane, she sucks in a foretaste of the death they will someday share in a lovely dark mausoleum in Yorba Linda. And now her husband stretches out beside her and her daughters hold her hands. She sees the woods looming above all else, knows it is time to tuck her cigarettes away, rise from whichever hidden marble stairwell she has dirtied this time with her habit and walk to the helicopter. Cold War Russian Lessons. Mrs. O'Neill has her eye on her neighbor. No one else wears a suit on weekdays, doesn't work on Tuesdays. No one else in the Bronx knows so much about farming. Da. Spasiba. 
and lots of other ruski words slow drip from a machine on the other side of the wall. Her neighbor repeats the words night after night. There's only one thing it can mean. She shushes Kieran and Kevin in the bath so she can hear the spy next door sending messages. He whines and whirs the machine. She pours water from a red, gray, and blue Yankees commemorative cup over each boy's head. The water cocoons their suddenly eyeless faces. It shuts them up. She watches the shampoo run clear, tells the boys to make each other's hair squeak. A lifetime is passing here, even here, in 1,100 square feet, barely hanging on the industrial edge of the Bronx, inside four walls thin enough for Mrs. O'Neill to investigate a national emergency that no one wants to hear about, certainly not Tommy O'Neill, who tells her enough already, or Peg on the third floor with her rashy Christine, who still smiles at the spy, still waves, still flirts to say the word that's the truth. Don't get her started on Peg or get her started on communists, who we're supposed to hate now, even though we liked them back when they hated Hitler too. Every evening, Mrs. O'Neill leans out the kitchen window. She's supposed to be finding the boys in the playground for dinner, but she always takes a moment to feel the breeze coming off the Harlem River like a summer getaway. Tonight, perhaps, she'll see her spy turn into the projects from River Avenue. If the moment is right, the sun will radiate behind his head on a glorious field of red. My next poem is called Ancient Philosophy. The ancients, East and West, liked their philosophy the way my mother liked her life, religious, ethical, comprehensive. Sometime in her 40s, my mother became a student of Socrates, Marcus Aurelius, Confucius. She borrowed a copy of the Upanishads from the Queensborough Public Library in Jamaica. She said things like, human beings cannot live without challenge. We cannot live without meaning. Now, she thinks she has been moved to a new location in the middle of the night, and all she was allowed to bring was the comb she discovered by her bedside. She thinks someone filed a lawsuit against New York City using her identity and stole all the money they were awarded in her name. She thinks she suffers regular home invasions by small, dirty orphans who need her help and threaten to hurt her if they don't get it. Now, I am required to think for her, so I try to think like her. My mother and I seem to have wandered barefoot into the heart of mystery. When the assaults stop, we will at last know that we never could have known anything at all. Uh, and my last poem uh, is called Mundus Novus. A gutter is unmoored. The hairy fingers of a tree root ball are exposed to the sky. Wind-blown leaf debris obliterates the distinction between street and sidewalk. I move carefully on top of my memory of the path and stumble at the forgotten curb but my daughters run ahead, tossing their arms and legs and heads like ponies released into the wild after the hurricane. I follow their joyful shrieks as closely as I can because the old world has been destroyed by rain and wind. We venture into the new. We pass what was the Lester place long in foreclosure, the banker in no hurry to end it all, now the storm has taken half the garage. Across the street, 
Mrs. Berman's perfect ranch looks too disheveled to be out in public without shame. The girls love it. They run, they run lines up and down the retired geometry teacher's lawn, pulling branches and small logs into piles to stake their land claim with their labor. Next, they find a new shortcut to Johnson Park, but the park is gone, swallowed by the river, dotted with oaks ripped in half and a red slate restroom roof skimming the top beside a drowned dugout. The girls move to the muddy river edge to study the surface and yell sighting reports back to me on the grass. I see Rick Lester walking his fluffy mutt toward me from downriver. I start to offer sympathy about the garage, but Rick waves me off and whispers, I've been all the way down to the stables. If we keep going, he tells me, we will find nine drowned horses floating on the track where I used to watch them trot grandly, faster, 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 their blinded heads straining forward to win nothing they could ever have really wanted for themselves. I cannot scan the river for their bloated bodies. I have seen too much. I tell my daughters it is time to turn back. I want to protect them, but I know it is not they who seek safety. They still heat seek the world's grisly details, dance at the edge in rain slicks like cloaks of invincibility too small for their elders. Take for yourselves what you need, you inheritors of a new world. Be little philosophers, my children, my beloved little ponies. Thank you. Thank you, especially to Jim and my fellow poets and to AWP. Thank you all very much. Thank you. It's been an honor and a privilege, and I hope it continues to be an honor and a privilege to work with all of you. Uh, both, And I really delight in being able to introduce you to each other and your, each other's work. And I think uh, for the most part, that's it. <laughs>